My perspective from the time that I spent on the court and subsequently is that in many ways the problem was more a policy decision that was taken to try to settle cases to the end of the earth on the basis of what is sometimes described incorrectly uh, in my view as the willing seller, willing buyer approach. And the consequence of that is that you had to wait for and often years for the parties to try and reach agreement. What should have happened if there was going to be a successful judicial process is either no mediation or negotiation, because that's what we did in Kosovo. We didn't have provision for mediation or negotiation. Hmm. People put in their claims and we decided them. And that was that. And some people got their land and some people lost their land. And we moved forward quickly. Um, in fact, from most of the decision making, we excluded lawyers. Uh, and in that way, we were able to do a completed claims process in a period of seven years. So, yes, there is merit in what you say. Uh, I think it can be judicial, but it needs to be a different judicial model. What is sad is that we didn't look sufficiently overseas, both in Kosovo and places like Bosnia, um, in relation to the uh, compensation claims from the first Gulf War, mass claims processing, processing techniques were used. What we would do in Kosovo is we had a... Uh, a directorate that would collect similar cases and one decision would immediately sign off on several hundred cases where all the facts were identical in relation to those cases. And so those kind of things could have allowed a judicial process, but it needed to be tailored for the fact that any claims process of this nature means you've got to deal with a very large number mm. of claims from the outset in a, in, in a, in a, in a confined period of time. Those to me seem to be the, the seem to me to be the problems, and there was a further problem that arose from the from that version of willing seller, willing buyer, which is that I think prices got driven up. I think um, I think often people ended up being being over overcompensated through that process. I think there should have been an allocation of a fixed period of time. If you're going to have a negotiation, you must settle it in in, in, in say a week or something like that. If you can't settle it, you must go to court. Court must decide it. Um, I think that would be my response yes. to your question. Thank you, Chief Justice. That's the end of the longest question in the history of the, <laughs> <laughs> of the JSC. Thank you. Um, um, Thank was you. it, uh, Nassim, before you come in, I think Deputy President Betts had a, oh, yes, had a yes. question. Yes, that Thank is you. so, uh, Chief Justice. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Dodson. Good afternoon, Deputy oh. President. You know, having had the benefit of going through the documentation that you provided to the commission, uh, I got a sense that from your student days, um, years as, a, as an attorney, you know, uh, and, and counsel, you have been on the side of the, you know, marginalized, uh, less privileged, disadvantaged, um, would you say that is the, a fair assessment of who you are and what you represent? Yes. Thank you. And most eminent counsel would find their niche in commercial and intellectual property work, uh, where the financial rewards, as we know, are much better than would be the case with uh, public interest uh, lawyers. Uh, what, what was the source of your passion and considerations that weighed with you for you to take a different direction? Just briefly, you need not uh, really elaborate. I think it was my experience at university. Um, I remember at an early stage, uh, there was a meeting in the student hall that was going to be addressed by one of Nelson Mandela's daughters, and the security police arrived and broke up the broke up the meeting. And uh, it was those kind of experiences, along with uh, obviously the debate and the involvement in organisations like NUSAS, that affected my perspective. And through that process, I I had the sense that. In a country like ours, as a lawyer, you cannot look the other way. You have to see if there are ways of using your skills as a lawyer uh, to better society and to make the system work for uh, marginalized people. Thank you. 
uh, advisedly, I'm, I'm not going to take you through uh, some of the judgments that you have penned. Speaking for myself, uh, I'm satisfied that the record speaks for itself. But I just want to put to you my notion of a good judge and then hear what your comment would be on that. And this is what I've, I've, I've noted. Um, the, the attributes of a good judge, one, experience, scholarship, dignity, rationality, forensic skills, humility, a capacity for articulation, discipline, diligence, intellectual integrity, intolerance for injustice, emotional maturity, courage, objectivity, energy, both physical and intellectual, rigor, Solomonic wisdom or modicum of it, efficiency. Do you think that you possess those attributes to a degree sufficient to make you a, a good judge? Well, the more comfortable answer is to say it's for the, for the commis commission to decide. But as I understand it, we were told to come here and brag to a degree. So Indeed. I, I, I said, with, I, I think I do. I think I do possess, possess those qualities. And if I may, if I may, with respect, compliment you on on that articulation of the uh, of the requirements for judicial office. And and in conclusion, I've got another general proposition that I want to put to you. You know, as as, as judges, we are part and parcel of the various communities that make up our nation. I, I take it that you do subscribe to, to yes. that proposition. Yes. But as, as judges, there are ethical and moral standards that all judges must scrupulously observe at all times. And they should instinctly, instinctively know what to say and how to say it and know that you know something should never be said by a, a judge um, either at all or in a particular way. And that judges must always guard against even, you know, their subconscious prejudices or biases. Indeed, I would certainly go along with that, Deputy President. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Justice. That's all. Chief Justice, Julius. Thank you, Deputy President. I think uh, I, I must apologize to you because I haven't made you aware that you can't ask as many questions. <clears throat> we are limited to, to two questions subject to one requiring a follow-up. Point taken, Chief Justice. Uh, Thank you. Uh, uh, Commissioner Malema, should I, should I note you? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Singh? Thank, thank you very much, uh, Chief Justice, and good afternoon, Advocate uh, Dotson. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I, I note your, your experience in land matters, and I'm not surprised that you were nominated by Mr. Jeff, uh, Jeff Budland, the senior counsel, uh, who is a guru on land matters. But, but having, having said that, I think I just want to follow up on the Deputy President of the SCA, where he listed the attributes of a judge. And I think the first thing that he said in listing those attributes was experience. Now, when I look at your CV, you last served on the land claims uh, court as a judge uh, 20 years ago, just from 1995 to 2000. And then from, for six years, from 2012 to 2018, you had 14 weeks of experience in the Kauteng High Court, just 14 weeks in six years. Now, how would you mitigate this reality 
against the criteria of experience on the bench, which is one of the attributes that uh, the Deputy President mentioned. Thank you, Chief Justice. Commissioner Singh, my response to that is that I chaired the uh, commission that was established by the United Nations in Kosovo. That was effectively a judicial position. Uh, we wrote uh, an enormous number of judgments. Those are, in fact, the subject matter of two books that have been published. Uh, that was for a period of seven years uh, that, that, that coincided with uh, my time as, as an advocate. Uh, in addition, uh, I think it's probably for about 16 of those years I sat on the disciplinary committee of the Independent Regulatory Board for Auditors. It's a position that's reserved either for a retired judge or for senior counsel. And effectively, the way that the decisions are given by that committee is in the form of detailed, lengthy judgments, which are indistinguishable from a court judgment. I've attached one of those to my second nomination uh, as, 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 as one of the decisions. I can give you the details if you'd like me to, but it is, it is there as an annexure to the, to the second nomination. Uh, in addition, I have also acted in the Land Claims Court uh, as an acting judge, having been there permanently, and uh, I've also acted briefly in the Labour Court. Well, thank I, you, I, I should perhaps also mention that I've done a number of arbitrations. Thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you very much, Honorable Singh. Honorable Malem. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chief Justice. I'm just worried you said we are asking two questions. So I had 15 years, so I don't know how I'm going to navigate that one. Um, does Section 25 provide for expropriation of land without compensation? Yes. Can you expand on that? Yes. Uh, in my view, if one applies the criteria other than market value, uh, and please speak to the speak into the mic. Uh, certainly, uh, I was try, trying to look at commission, trying to look at Commissioner Malema. Yeah. Please out of, don't. Uh, please out don't. of respect yeah. to him, um, in my view, yes. Uh, if one applies the other criteria. Uh, other than market value, and the net effect of those is that you end up with a zero value property, uh, then there must be expropriation without compensation. I act, for example, for a community who were uh, restored land on which there is a decommissioned dam uh, that used to belong to a water board, as well as a loss making nature reserve. The uh, Water Board were awarded 16 million rand in compensation for the land. The community inherited a loss-making asset, which is causing enormous trouble for them. And I've advised them that they should, uh, they should bring a challenge to the original agreement by which they restored the land on the basis that there should have been no compensation paid to the Water Board. And that, in fact, that 16 million rand or something of that order ought to have been awarded to them as financial compensation to enable to deal with the loss-making asset that they were then handed. Is there any specific case where you can refer us where the state expropriated land without compensating the owners of the land and there were no serious uh, legal challenges or consequences to that effect? The only examples I have are the two that I gave, which I advised in relation to the National Forest Act, but I don't know of any other cases, no. Now, Given the fact that you have not acted at the Constitutional Court um, and you are a white male with no such experience of acting at the Constitutional Court, what makes it so special for you to be appointed at the Constitutional Court against all other people who have acted at the Constitutional Court who are black, some are females and are contributing to their appointment will be a contribution to the transformation of the judiciary. What makes it so unique? What is it so unique about you that will make us want to overlook the previously disadvantaged people who are qualified like you, 
who have got every uh, thing that it takes, even even beyond, because they've got an experience. You come from not being there in the lower courts and building up and acting in the uh, Supreme Court of Appeal and Constitutional Court, acting there. You, you haven't done that. You just come straight, boo, into the Constitutional Court. What is so unique about you? I, I would never profess any uniqueness about myself, and that isn't the basis on which I come here. The basis on which I made uh, myself available in response to a nomination, or two nominations, was on the basis of Section 174, Section 5 of the Constitution. That's a provision that says that uh, four of the 11 judges must have been serving judges at the time that they were appointed. In my view, the implication of that is that the framers of the Constitution wanted a range of influences. It's exactly the same in respect to Section 174.2 in respect of the race and gender provisions. And I'm not sure if you've read, but there was an article written by uh, Bayete Maswazi, who, who at the time I think was the Deputy President of the BLA. He wrote an article in the Advocate magazine in response to uh, uh, a speech that was given to J by Judge Kachalia about transformation and the work of the Judicial Services Commission. And the point that Mr. Maswazi made was that what the Constitution wants is a range of perspectives to influence, influence its adjudication. Uh, that's the reason why there's 174.2. It's not simply a game of pigmentation. What the framers of the Constitution want is a range of different experiences so that people come there and give their perspectives and enrich their adjudication. I don't claim to be special, but what I do have is a different path through adjudication. I don't say there's anything particularly special about it, but what I say is that it can be of assistance to the Constitutional Court, and the provision has been used for other judges. Uh, judge Mutlanga, who serves on the court at the moment, followed a similar path. He also wasn't uh, a judge at the time that he was appointed. The same with uh, Justice Yacoub. The same with Justice Chaskelson, um, and I think there are some others too. So my application is humbly brought. I completely respect the Judicial Services Commission's uh, difficult task that they have in applying Section 174.2. They also have to apply with respect to Section 174.5, and that is the basis upon which I make myself <coughs> I have made myself available. But obviously, I respect the decision that you come to. But the point I'm making is that by appointing you, will be we will we be advancing the transformation of the judiciary? Yes, we will, and I say that for this reason: transformation is not an issue that relates solely to the demographic representation uh, on the bench. Transformation of the judiciary is also a style of adjudication and what is taken into account by judges when they, when they decide cases. And I would respectfully submit that the particular path that I've followed, which has been different from almost every other lawyer, has provided me with insights, has provided me with perspectives that I can helpfully bring to bear. But most importantly, if one looks at the articles which have been written in particular by Justice Langer and by Justice Musneke, about transformative constitutionalism and transformative adjudication. Transformation goes much wider and it's the style of adjudication is also part of it. And I believe that my experience can bring with it a style of adjudication that can be of assistance to the court. Thank you, CJ. CJ, CJ. Thank you very much, Malema. Uh, who is uh, signifying the intention to speak? Dodo. Yes, Honorable Dodo. Yes. Uh, I move from section 25 to section 26, which encapsulates the fact that everyone has got the right to adequate housing. And I noticed that you were the chairperson of an international tribunal, as we say, in, in Kosovo. But I want to take you here at home. Are you familiar with the landmark judgment of the Huadbuam case? 
Yes. How do you think that it will assist communities which are still suffering from poor sanitation, no land, and, and no shelter at all? That judgment. The judgment effectively introduced a criterion of reasonableness in assessing what government does. Uh, it rejected uh, the minimum core argument. In other words, that you could on the basis of section 26 say that there must be a certain level of that right that has to be provided in a concrete and substantive way. Uh, the consequence of it has been very, very important though and it has had practical consequences, but it has focused on temporary emergency accommodation. That's where its real uh, benefit, I think, has been felt. And it's an important benefit. It's one where you can no longer have a situation where people are simply thrown onto the streets. Temporary emergency accommodation has to be provided. And that was really a concrete result of that decision. And it's informed a range of other judgments. Where I accept that the judgment wouldn't perhaps achieve the ideal scenario that we would want is in going further beyond temporary emergency accommodation. But I think one moves into a terrain where that becomes difficult for courts. Uh, Section 26.1 is a right that is a socioeconomic right to be progressively realized, and that creates constraints on the court's ability to intervene to ensure that uh, people are given adequate housing on a wider scale than temporary emergency accommodation. So where I would concede is it has perhaps been of less benefit is for those who seek a permanent housing solution. And there I, I think the, the, the country remains in a terrible shortfall. Uh, the, that section you're referring to speaks to the progressive realization which acknowledges that government will not solve all the problems. But the judgment itself, as I understand it, is very critical of the national housing program that it has got limitations, like you're saying, uh, it, uh, it wasn't providing relief, especially for the poor people. <coughs> in your view, in your view, do you think that the government has addressed that particular area? If not, in what ways can it elevate that particular point to ensure that uh, the poor, especially the, especially the landless, have access to land, have got access to housing and, and all other sanitary facilities. I think one must perhaps distinguish between land and housing. Um, on the side of land, there was a very comprehensive survey done by the high level panel, which I'm sure you're aware of, that was chaired by former President uh, Mutlante. Uh, which did a survey of all of the legislation. And I formed part of a group that, that, that contributed to, to the high-level panel. Uh, one of the things that, one of the observations that we made is that there isn't a focused legislation to deal with redistribution of land. There needs to be a separate, distinct statute that provides for that arm of land reform. Uh, the separate issue is is the difficult issue of housing. Um, there, the focus in the in the in the cases has tended to be on these situations where people are faced with eviction, um, and one must wait to see if a case comes forward at a particular point in time uh, to look beyond that and to say, look, so many years have passed now in a democracy. Uh, perhaps a challenge could be brought on the basis to say government hasn't done enough now. Uh, to move towards that progressive realization. Certainly for people out there, the people who really feel the effects of poor sanitation, of poor housing or lack of housing, you're living in informal settlements, they haven't received the promise of Section 26.1. On a lighter note, C uh, CCJ, the, the Deputy President of uh, CA says, one of the modicum of a good judge is is that you must have Solomonic wisdom. Do you think in honesty that you have that? Yes, I do. Okay, thanks. <laughs> CJ? Oh, yes. 
Um, yes, uh, colleague, I can't uh, see the colleague who's uh, just announced yourself. Please. Please. CJ, it's Tepe. Uh, before you, uh, Commissioner Tepe, there was someone else. I think a man's it's voice. Sigogo, I think. Yeah, it's Sigogo. Okay. Yeah. Yes, uh, Commissioner Sigogo. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Um, you, you, you quoted in your response to Commissioner Malema the views of um, Mr. Abayat Maswazi. I, I believe the reason you quoted him is that you regard his opinion in that regard in as far as appointments to the judiciary is concerned. Is it, I agree with it? Yes. Yes, I agree with his article. I thought, it, I, thought it was, I thought it was a good response to, I thought it was a good response. Okay, thank you. I'm raising this issue because the, the organization um, which he represent, the Black Lives Association, uh, commented about your application for appointment to the Constitutional Court. And it says you, you are not ready to be appointed yet because you haven't set um, an acting stint in the Constitutional Court. What do you say if it, when it comes to the person you so regard in this regard? I didn't hear the last part of what you said. What, what do I say? Well, what do you say to that comment from the Black Lives Association, taking into account that it comes from uh, one of the people that you, you, you regard their views in as far as appointments to the judiciary is concerned? I think my answer would, would largely be the same as my answer to, to uh, Commissioner Manema. Um, in my view, that my, my, my path has involved adjudication all along. I think I've had sufficient experience to be able to assume a position on the constitutional court bench. It's a decision that must ultimately obviously be taken by the Judicial Services Commission. Uh, but again, if one looks at the other appointees, that have gone the 1745 route. Uh, I speak subject to correction, but I'm not sure that any of them, perhaps save for uh, Justice Mudlunga, I'm not sure about his position, but I don't, I don't think that any of the others who went that route acted on the uh, constitutional court before, beforehand. And obviously it's, it's a more difficult, I, I, I don't know if there's a precedent ready for, for, for the appointment of people from the bar to to uh, to act on the on the on the constitutional court, but I would submit that the different path that I have followed would provide sufficient experience for me to be able to assume a position on the court. Uh, I've seen, uh, lastly, I've seen in your um, questionnaire that you you have um, underlying conditions. Um, I would like to know if that would, may not be a bar or a, a cause some difficulties to you in respect of uh, performing your duties in, in that court at that level. Yeah, I mean, as I said in, the, in, in, my, in my documentation, I have a relatively benign form of cancer. Uh, I have never had to have any treatment for it. It was diagnosed, I think I said seven years ago. In fact, I worked out previously, worked out that it was, I think, about 10 years ago that it was, that it was in fact, diagnosed. Um, it has had absolutely no impact on me health-wise to date. Uh, I'm fit. I work incredibly hard. I work long hours. Uh, I run. I cycle. I play other sports. Um, the prognosis is that uh, if the condition develops. Uh, I have to have one round of chemotherapy. Uh, the science on that round of chemotherapy is that in 95% of cases, it's completely successful for a minimum period of 10 years. Uh, there be no need yet for me to have the chemotherapy. So certainly as I see it and as the oncologist treating me sees it, uh, there's absolutely no reason for that to be an obstacle. Thank you, CJ. Thank you, thank you, Commissioner Sigoro. Uh, Commissioner Tsepe. Thank you, CJ. Good afternoon, Advocate Dotson. Good afternoon, Commissioner Chapin. Um, the Constitution requires courts when interpreting any legislation or when developing the common law or customary law to promote the spirit, purpose, and objects of the Bill of Rights. What I wanted to find out from you is what has been your experience, especially in specialist courts, 
uh, to the observance by judges of this constitutional obligation? And can you point to cases that you wrote um, that reflects your observance of this constitutional obligation? I just need to think about that in terms of, of, of my own cases. Um, but, but certainly, uh, I think that in, uh, in all of the courts of the country, the provisions of Section 39.2 have been embraced, uh, particularly as far as the development of the common law is concerned in accordance with the values in the Constitution. Uh, it's been the subject matter of some debate between the Constitutional Court and the uh, Supreme Court of Appeal when it comes to the question of unfair contract terms. Um, I think that that debate has been, uh, I think, taken a healthy step forward by the Constitutional Court's judgment in the Bideka judgment, uh, the, the majority judgment. Um, I don't think it's the final word on the matter. I think that there's a lot of further development of the law that's going to have to take place as far as unfair contract terms are concerned. Um, the, 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 the question insofar as it pertains to my own judgments are concerned, um, I have always tried to infuse the principles of the Constitution into my adjudication. So, for example, if you look at my transport judgment, which I attached to my nominations, um, there were two, uh, well, there was a particular difficulty in relation to that case in that the claimants had to prove that they were dispossessed of a right in land. The ironic difficulty is that they were disadvantaged by apartheid insofar as their ability to have rights in land was seriously undermined. And therefore, to provide a just solution to the case, what I did is to look to uh, a definition of beneficial occupation, which took into account the common law, but also infused it with uh, the purposive approach to interpretation that Section 39.2 requires. Uh, and I tempered the requirements to make sure that the community was able to show at the end of the day that they were dispossessed of rights and land, even though apartheid didn't recognize their rights to a large degree uh, in that land. Um, the other case that perhaps illustrates my ability to do that is the AXA case, the airports company case, uh, where... Uh, 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 Advocate Dodson, I'm sorry to interrupt. Let me just find out from Commissioner Tsepe whether she's satisfied or she would want you to continue. Uh, Commissioner Tsepe, are you covered or do you want him to elaborate? If he could further? deal with the AXA matter, I'll be, I'll be happy, Chair. Okay, all right. Well, you recall that in the AXA matter, it was a question of whether or not uh, there was an implied term uh, I beg your pardon, a tacit term that should be read into the contract that it would only, uh, the lease would only come to an end once there had been a lawful award of a tender. And I built into the tacit term a requirement of constitutional compliance uh, on the basis that that would be what people would anticipate, what the reasonable bystander would participate in a constitutional dispensation. Thank you, CJ. Chief Justice, Chief Justice, Chief Justice, Chief Go, is there any other colleague who also wants to to speak apart from Advocate Madonzela? Yes, yes, Chief yes, Justice, yes, yes. Commissioner Muimam. May I just draw up a list? Chief Justice, Benny Payne, if you could oh. please place me on your list. Uh, Commissioner Muimam, Thank you. Uh, Chief Justice. Thank you. Any other? Yeah, I'm Chief Justice. Justice. Um, Lambo. Uh, was it, uh, 
Commissioner uh, Schlemmer with Tim Lambo. Do we have another one? And we Mwanisha. Thank you. Do we have another one apart from Honorable Mwanisha? Uh, we Chief Justice. I've got you. Uh, you'll come immediately after Advocate Kane. Thank you. Sorry, there is Thank one you. from Sir Kaba. Okay, Honorable Kaba. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, uh, Advocate Madonzela, over to you, sir. Thank you, Chief Justice. Uh, Mr. Dodson, I'm here. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, Commissioner. Uh, I see from your questionnaire that you are married to a judge. Yes. Or you're a partner to a judge. Yes. And uh, a sitting judge in the high court. Yes. And uh, don't you think that your position in the appellate court, like the constitutional court, may place you in a precarious position in relation to the cases emanating from the bench where your judge sits? Uh, I ask because you may have a familiarity with the extra curia discussions happening in that court, extra judicial happenings in the court where your your your, your judge is sitting. Okay, I'm not sure if I understood the last part of the question, but uh, I, as, as I understand your question, is is there a difficulty with the fact that? Uh, my wife is a high court judge and that I'll be sitting in the constitutional court and maybe sitting in judgment on her judgments. Uh, uh, and your familiarity and the, the close familiarity you might have with her as a, uh, in relation to her position in the discussions or what's happening in the court where she comes from, generally outside of judicial work. Well, I... I don't think there's a difficulty in non-case related information about non-case related discussions that might take place in the High Court. Uh, obviously, there are issues that would arise in a situation which is case specific. Um, so, were she to have sat in a case, um, a question would arise as to whether were I to be appointed to the Constitutional Court, if that case went on appeal, I could sit in that same case. Uh, my broad answer is to say that one is going to have to, in a society, in an egalitarian society, which takes into account uh, uh, the rights of men and women to be treated equally, um, one is going to increasingly have situations where husband and wives are both in the judiciary. It's already happening in the United Kingdom. Uh, I think it's Lady Arden, if I remember correctly, uh, who is married to Lord Mance. She was on the uh, Supreme Court and uh, Lord Mance was on the Court of Appeal. And in fact, ultimately, in one case, they in fact sat together on the, on the Supreme Court. Uh, Lady Black, I think, is in the same position. And they seem to have managed to navigate the position successfully. I think that a mature approach is going to, going to be required to be able to accommodate uh, spouses, uh, both being in different parts of the, of the judicial system. A conservative view would probably say, that I would have to recuse myself in judgments that were to come uh, from her uh, before me. Um, again, I think one is going to have to look at those situations. I think the law has to find and, and adjudication has to find solutions to them. It may be that in a case where there was a judgment that wasn't penned by her, it might be appropriate for me to sit in the constitutional court. Um, but I think that solutions are, are, are obviously going to be, to be found. Um, and, and workable solutions are going to be found if one takes a proper uh, approach to adjudication that recognizes that there can't be unfair discrimination. Um, it's not every case that's going to be coming before the Constitutional Court that, where she's going to have been one of, the, one of the judges. And even if it were to be ultimately settled on the basis that I must recuse myself in any case that she was in any way resolved, involved in, I don't think that's going to be a difficulty. Um, to some extent, one had it with, I think, in a slightly different form uh, with Justice O'Regan when her husband was counsel and she recused herself, I think, from cases where which, which he argued. But I think that workable solutions have to be found 
to accommodate particularly women in the profession? Uh, maybe others will take up the, the issue. I, had, I have a follow, uh, follow up question, but I have another question. I don't want to exhaust my question. Uh, I, the second question I want to ask is uh, if it's really necessary, you can ask your follow up question, uh, Commissioner Matanzela. And, and just, then go to the next question. Oh, for as long as I want for free. If you really, if it's uh, really necessary, no, 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 you won't. If it's really necessary, you uh, please go ahead. Yes. Don't you think that uh, if you were to be appointed in an appellate court, like the Constitutional Court, you would be exposed to what I might call judicial gossip? that happens in the court where your wife is? That's actually the question. That might expose you to certain discussions that happened in corridors in the high court where you come from, where your wife comes from. Now having to sit in, in the appellate court as a, as a member of the court, knowing certain inside information about cases and decisions which are made in the high court where you came from, don't you think it might spoil the entire uh, <clears throat> relationship between, or the confidence, public confidence, in you sitting in the high court, in the, appeal, in the appeal court, in cases where your wife may have an understanding of what's happening in the high court, either judicially or extrajudicially? I, I, I don't think so. I. I, frankly, I'm not a gossip, so, um, and my wife would know that very well. I'm not particularly interested in gossip. Uh, I might be unusual from that point of view, but anybody who knows me will, will bear me out as far as that is concerned. But the, the courts are not hermetically sealed. I think it's in some ways irrelevant that we're married. I think gossip spreads between one court and another, whether it's because somebody's married or not, whether somebody because somebody's a friend or somebody's a former fellow group member or there are a whole range of of past relationships that mean that there isn't a hermetic seal between the courts from a gossip point of view and and uh, I, I, uh, I i don't i don't think that I, I don't think that's a problem that's unique to the fact that that i have a wife who is uh, that i have a wife who is a judge uh, if i can just dilute my second question you have said as a judge of the land claims court and uh, i know that and i've encountered you in other cases where you are my opponent uh, in land matters restitution claims and i've seen more often of you acting for the commission and in some instances also acting for the landowners and uh, I want to ask the question in relation to your role now as a, an aspirant judge of the Constitutional Court. With the experience that you have amassed over the years in land matters on all the sides, is it your sense that the, the, the jurisprudence of the Constitutional Court as it currently stands does not adequately advance a progressive realization of land restitution. And if so, I want to know if your ascension to the Constitutional Court, if it were to happen, in what respect do you think your expertise in land matters will uh, improve the achievement of land or development of, of jurisprudence that relates to land, land restitution to claimants? I think that there are certain judgments I think of of three in particular that create significant difficulties for restitution. And where I've really come to feel those difficulties is acting on behalf of communities claiming their land. 
the effect of those judgments is to make it a really massive undertaking for a community to prove in court their, their, their claim to, to an entitlement to restoration of land. Uh, the judgments that concern me as far as that is concerned are the uh, impeller judgments, impeller versus Hockton Boudre of the Supreme Court of Appeal and the Constitutional Court. And I think perhaps the, 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 with the, with, and, and I say that with the greatest of respect, um, the, the Bapiring judgment of the Supreme Court of Appeal. The judgments are well intentioned, but they add under the heading of feasibility, which you'll be familiar with from Section 33 of the Restitution Act, a number of additional hoops that have to be jumped through by a claimant who wants to successfully prove a, a, a claim to land. And those have presented real difficulties, uh, just in terms of the massive evidence that has to be adduced. Even in a situation where the community, community can show quite clearly that they were dispossessed as a result of apartheid, and lost the land because of apartheid, there's a whole lot of additional criteria that has to be satisfied. And Sorry to interrupt you, but it seems that the Constitutional Court got that from in rare Kranskrop, which you penned when you were a judge in the land claims court. Sorry? It seems that the Constitutional Court, when adopting that approach, got that from your judgment in, no. in dress group. No. In dress no. no, not at all. In fact, if you read up, it's either paragraph 91 or 92 of Kranzburg. I warned specifically against uh, the problems that would come if, for example, you start requiring the community to show how they were going to use the land successfully and so on. Uh, so uh, if one then looks at Bapi Ring, Bapi Ring, as well as Impera versus Hark Turnbolt, add on to the feasibility criterion a whole lot of other requirements. Have a look at paragraph 18 and paragraph 19 of the Bapi Ring judgment. And that's where the difficulty comes in. They don't follow Kranzburg. Uh, in fact, in a sense, they probably go against it. But at the very least, they add on to Kranzburg a whole range of criteria, whereas I specifically said in Kranzburg, don't go further with this, because if you do, it's going to substantially reduce the ability of people to get their land back. And I said that's a major purpose of the Restitution Act, is for people to have their land restored to them. I can't remember whether it's paragraph 91 or 92, but you'll find it there, and it's yeah, no, attached I've to it, both nominations. I've got it in front of me, but I don't want us to get into a debate about that. But the other issue is... But that, I, I still haven't yeah, I responded to, to the second part of your question, yes. in response to the second part of your question. I, as you can see from my answer, I know where the shoe pinches as far as land issues are concerned. I know where the difficulties lie. And in my view, it will be of assistance to the Constitutional Court when they're dealing with adjudication of land issues to have the insights that I have in relation to where the shoe pinches and where the problems <coughs> are that are preventing land reform from happening. Of course, the only problem that I have with that is that uh, and which leads to another question, please, the Chief Justice will forgive No, 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 uh, you've got to seek permission, Commissioner Madonzella. You have exhausted your two questions. Thank you. you need, uh, uh, you desperately need to ask the, the third question. No, I, I'm not desperate to ask. Okay, all right, thank you. Let's move on to Commissioner Kane then. Uh, Advocate Kane. Thank you, Chief Justice, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, we have uh, heard a great, uh, a great deal about your expertise in land-related matters. I would not like the Commission to be deprived of some description of your role um, as the Chair of the Independent Regulatory Board of Auditors Disciplinary Committee. And in the interest of full disclosure, I need to tell the Commission that I served with you there but perhaps you could cover these topics. Firstly, um, was that an act of public service or did you earn ordinary advocates rates doing that work? What kind of issues did you adjudicate on and how much of your time away from private practice did that work take? And how recently did you perform that service? Uh, no, I performed that work as a, as a public service for substantially reduced uh, remuneration. Uh, and I did it because I came with judicial skills from my time on the land claims court. That's how I became involved in the work. Um, the, perhaps just to explain to the commission the, the nature of the work, um, the work 
requires essentially uh, going into whether audits were correctly conducted into um, the the in the preparation of financial statements for various forms of of business entities. Um, it requires a uh, an understanding of. Uh, the commercial background to what is being audited, it requires an ability to uh, understand and interpret uh, financial statements, and then it requires an ability to evaluate whether or not the auditor performed their duties of appropriately forming an opinion as to whether the financial statements fairly reflect the uh, the the, uh, the 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 financial state of the of the of the company uh, or the organisation in question. Uh, that gave me a substantial exposure to commercial work, to company law, uh, and to the specific requirements of the uh, Audit Profession Audit Profession Act. Uh, in terms of the time or part of my practice that it took up, it varied depending on the, the caseload over the years. Uh, in some years, it took up a very large part of my time, in other years, less so. Uh, in, I should also disclose that at the end of last year, I resigned uh, from from the position um, and that followed a very long um, and there, there isn't a, a causal link between them um, but it followed just to give an illustration of the kind of time that was involved uh, it was a case that involved the uh, inquiry into the auditors of African Bank um, and I think at the end of the day we must have heard something like 70 days of evidence it was a massive piece of litigation I think that the judgment which I wrote, the decision which I wrote there is of the order of 470 pages and it involved the audit of a bank, which is one of the most complex uh, auditing and commercial tasks that one can can come across. I'm not sure if that satisfactorily answers your question, uh, Commissioner Kane. Yes, thank you very much. It does. Thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you very much, uh, Advocate Kane. Uh, Honorable Maimam. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chief Justice. Uh, good, good afternoon, uh, Advocate Dodson. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Uh, the uh, eviction of farm workers uh, continues unabated despite the the enactment of the Extension of Security of Tenure Act. I see that in one of your profiles. You dealt with... Uh, with Sorry, if you can speak up, please, Commissioner. I'm struggling a little bit to hear you. Thank you. I'm saying that in one of your in one of your uh, profile, you have uh, in your profile you have dealt with one one uh, related matter that dealt with the the eviction of farm workers, and uh, the eviction of farm workers continues unabated despite the extension of security of tenure act. Uh, from your uh, uh, experience, do you think that ESTA adequately protects farm workers? The second point, uh, the in, in your profile also, uh, there is a reflection of your uh, military military criminal record. Was this an isolated incident, or was this an integral part of the end conscription campaign? Thank you. Uh, Advocate, thank you, H. Justice. Thank you, Honorable Moema. Go ahead, Advocate Dodson. On the question in relation to uh, Esther, obviously, from a farm worker's point of view, one must also look at the uh, Land Reform Labor Tenants Act, although that is strictly speaking labor tenants. As far as they're concerned, and as far as one might, in a broader sense, regard them also as, as, as farm workers, uh, they've had a very unfortunate experience with the claims for uh, awards of land having been abysmally dealt with. And that relates to the Imolasi judgment, which I was lead counsel in, and in which we had uh, brought a case to court for the appointment of a special master to try and resolve that terrible conundrum where all of their thousands, I think it's 20,000 odd claims, I think about 10,000 of them haven't been properly dealt with. Turning to Esther, there's a legal and an empirical component to, to your question. Um, from an empirical point of view, if you say to me that evictions continue unabated, and I don't, don't doubt that, I just don't have my own evidence of it, uh, it suggests to me that ESTA isn't, isn't working. But if I look at ESTA um, 
in isolation. And if I look at the judgments of the Constitutional Court in relation to Esther, purely as a legal mechanism, uh, to be honest, I'm impressed with it. It, 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 it ought to, it ought to, in, uh, if, if the legislation were properly implemented, it ought to make a very substantial difference to the security of tenure of farm workers. Perhaps where the failings come in is the realities of marginalized rural people, difficult for them to get access to lawyers. Esther is going to be of no use to you if you haven't got a lawyer or somebody who's advising you that you can make use of Esther. Um, Esther is also not going to help you if somebody simply evicts you without bothering about the law and you end up in a situation where you have no recourse, you have no one to go to. So I think Esther as a law is good. I think the Constitutional Court's decisions on Esther are excellent with respect. Uh, but I accept what you say. If you say to me empirically, it's not working, I accept that. And uh, if the if the if the issue is to be addressed, I would tentatively suggest that it's need it needs to be addressed through uh, giving better access to legal representation uh, and resources for rural, for rural people. But it's difficult. Rural people are exposed by the fact that they're so far away from centres and so far away from help. To answer your question in relation to my criminal record with the military. Uh, was it an isolated incident or not? Uh, it, it wasn't an isolated incident in, in several respects. Um, there was, in fact, another occasion in which I similarly refused to take up arms against people in the townships and refused to do uh, township patrols. That was on another occasion. I wasn't charged. Well, I, I was charged on that occasion, but when I, I went for the, for the trial, um, they decided at the last minute to withdraw the charges and they tried to persuade me to change my views, which I said I wasn't prepared to do. Uh, the second time that it happened was when I was court-martialed. Um, so in that sense, it, 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 there was, it, 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 it was, there was a, re a repeat and, and I made it clear I was, never ever going to, I was never ever going to point a weapon at a fellow South African. I was never going to do township patrols. Uh, the second occasion, I was also asked, that I was told by the military that they were going to give me a fresh order each day uh, to go into the townships. And I said to them, you can give me a fresh order every day. I'm not going to go. I'm not going, I'm, I am not going to do it. And you can keep charging me a fresh if you want to. Um, and they backed off and they didn't, they didn't give me a fresh order ev every day. Uh, as far as the ECC is concerned, I was, I, was, I was a member of the ECC. I was involved in the ECC. Um, I dedicated a substantial part of my practice as an attorney in Cape Town to representing conscientious objectors. I represented Dr. Ivan Toms, uh, the famous crossroads doctor who was sentenced to a term of imprisonment for refusing to serve. Uh, and I represented many other people who objected to doing national service. Um, Professor Schlemmer? Uh, Chief Justice, please don't forget me. It's my turn. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll note you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chief Justice. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Um, I would like to ask you a couple of questions linked not to constitutional law, but to the fact that the Constitutional Court is now the apex court in all different fields of the law. We've heard a lot about your constitutional expertise. Could you elaborate a little bit more on your expertise in other matters, um, in other fields of law other than constitutional matters? Certainly. Um, I have had various exposure to commercial work. I was with a commercial firm of attorneys uh, when I worked in Cape Town. Um, there was a stage during which the funding for human rights work stopped and we had to transform ourselves into uh, part-time human rights lawyers and a lot of the time commercial lawyers. Uh, I was involved in commercial drafting of agreements. I was involved in commercial litigation. Um, and and uh, one of the things I did, in fact, at that time was to go and do a tax course at, at UCT. I got a qualification in tax law. Um, the reality of time on the land court, as I've said, is that a lot of the work relates to private law concepts. Um, and that gave me exposure to, to private law. Uh, a substantial part of labor law is also based on the private law contracts of employment. 
and a lot of pure contractual issues come up in the course of labor disputes. I've had many cases involving those. Uh, the other reality is that poor people also have private law problems. Uh, so, for example, the work that I've done in the two class actions for first gold mine workers and second coal mine workers, uh, what we're doing is enforcing, although by way of a constitutional class action, what we're really doing is enforcing their common law delictual claims. That's what lies at the heart of it. Uh, and that has uh, involved us and continues to involve us in a range of profound and difficult private law issues, issues relating to uh, strict liability, issues relating to causation, um, issues raised by the Lee judgment, for example, issues raised by the Fairchild judgment of the, of the English courts. Um, and then, as I've already said, my work on the Independent Regulatory Board for Auditors has given me exposure to, to, to a commercial side of work. And then I do have commercial cases from time to time. Um, I think my success rate in commercial cases is, is, is probably as good as my success rate in, in constitutional cases. Thank you for that. Um, just one last question. Um, it has been noted by quite a number of academics over the past number of years that the judgments that we often see written nowadays aren't as scholarly as they used to be. And what is your take on the scholarly writing of judgments for a judge? You responded to the deputy president's comment that a judge has to have scholarship as well. For me, the, the greatest privilege of being a judge is to write a judgment. Uh, for me, it's an extraordinary privilege for a human being to be able to uh, take the law and apply it through an adjudication process to a particular set of facts. Um, and uh, that was what uh, I enjoyed so much about the work on the Land Claims Court. And I believe that writing judgments is a scholarly exercise. Uh, yes, the uh, realities of the demands of modern day practice and the way that 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 the court roles uh, are heaped up are that often it's difficult for judges to be scholarly. But certainly when you're at the level of the appeal courts, uh, there's a need for, I think, uh, scholarly writing of judgments, careful research to be applied. Uh, but for me, that part of judgment writing is a pleasure. I, I think I know I'm blowing my own trumpet, but I, I think I wrote scholarly judgments when I was on the land camps court. Thank you, CJ. Thank you, Prof. Uh, JP Mlambo. Thank you, Chief Justice. Um, Advocate Detson, good afternoon. I just want to, you to tell us as a commission, uh, what is it that we should consider uh, persuasive in your candidate? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. I didn't hear the, all of your sentence. Oh, uh, I'm saying, um, I would like you to tell us, as a commission, what we should consider as persuasive regarding your candidate. I'm referring to your experience as an attorney, as an advocate, arguing cases in the highest courts of this land, sitting in the land claims court, the high court, and the labour court. What is it, what is the value add that you think we should look at uh, when we look at you, your, your, your candidature? Uh, to some extent, I've answered those questions in, re in response to the Chief Justice's questions at the beginning. But I, th I think that my value add is the range of exposure that I've had. Uh, I have done a range of work as counsel uh, and I have appeared in the Constitutional Court. I've argued and pre I've prepared, presented and argued cases in the Constitutional Court. Uh, I have prepared and argued cases in the Supreme Court of Appeal. I've argued cases in the High Courts. I've argued cases back in the Land Claims Court as an advocate. I've argued cases in the Labour Court. I've argued cases cases in the Labour Appeal Court. So I would submit that I would come to the Constitutional Court with a wide, wide range of experience. And I believe that one can't discount the 20 years that I've spent in practice. 
uh, half of those as senior counsel. One can't discount that as valuable experience for purposes of adjudication. It isn't only experience sitting as a judge that prepares one for adjudication. It's also working as counsel that prepares one for adjudication. The rational process that one goes through in preparing a set of heads of argument is almost indistinguishable from the rational process that one goes through in writing a judgment. And uh, I've done a, a lot of preparing of heads of argument, which I think has uh, taken advantage of the skills that I developed in the Land Claims Court. Uh, in the Land Claims Court, uh, it was a new court. We had to give a lot of thought to our judgments because it, the issues were novel. Uh, we were also concerned with issues in the Land Claims Court of making the legislation work for people. Um, one is always confronted, well, not always, but often confronted in land claims cases with an inequality of arms between uh, the lawyers on each of the two sides. The adversarial system of justice works well when you've got equally strong legal teams on each side. Often in the land claims court, we had to deal with a situation of a complete imbalance in power, but we still had to find a way of doing justice for the parties who came before us, including the party who had the, weak, the weaker representation. And I think that process of finding a path, dealing with the rights that are protected in section 25, provided me, yes, with skills in the area of land law, which I think is going to be a very important area of law in the years that are to come. But I think it goes beyond that. I think it prepared me also for writing judgments in other areas of constitutional adjudication. So uh, in my view, it, 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 is, it, is, it is those components of it that, that make a difference. I think that uh, for judges who have gone the route of attorneys to, to, to the bench, uh, I would submit that a route that goes uh, from counsel into the constitutional court is different, but is valuable. And to come back to the, the article by Mr. Maswasi from the BLA, what one wants on the constitutional court is a range, a range of perspectives, a range of backgrounds. And I think that my different path through the legal profession uh, is nonetheless a valid one that can be of assistance to the constitutional court. I'm not sure if that assists in, in, in answering your question. No, thank you very much. It does. And uh, my last question, CJ, is you were asked a question about scholarly judgments. I'm still trying to understand what that means, because from where I sit as a judge and head of court, and I want to know what your view is, when we write judgments as judges, we're not writing judgments for law reports or journals. We're writing for the parties. They need to know what we're saying about what they brought to us. What do you say to that? I, I, I think that's I think that's absolutely correct. Uh, that's the most important. That's the most important thing at the end of the day, and it's important that uh, it's important that people also get speedy justice, speedy justice, and correct justice. And uh, that would, in an appropriate case where there, there isn't a need for widespread research for a result to be achieved, uh, I think that's good. If I look, for example, at, um, I looked in the course of preparing for today, I looked at the judgments that were, that, 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 that involved uh, yourself uh, in relation to some of the issues in the, uh, in, in relation to the pandemic. So the Freedom Front Plus judgment and the, um, the one South Africa judgment, um, they were they were they were tough issues, uh, complex issues that required speedy speedy justice, and and that was produced by the the, the, the full benches that that you led. Um, I would regard those as scholarly judgments, but they didn't necessarily have the longest footnotes in the world. Um, so yes, I think that uh, the most important thing is to get it right for the parties, to get it right quickly for the parties, but where one moves into areas that are novel and, 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 and difficult, and where an appellate court has a little bit more time that's in, that, that, than that that is available in a busy high court. Uh, I think one can expect a bit more wide-ranging research. I think one can expect a little bit more by way of comparative, of comparative law influence. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you, CJ.
Uh, thank you, JP. Um, Honorable Magonisha. Thank you very much, CJ. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Advocate Dutson. Sorry, where are we? Yes, I've this got side. it. Sorry. <laughs> this side. Now, I must say that I was particularly impressed with your, your response to Commissioner Sokoko's question. Uh, that positive mind uh, helps a lot of people who are, who are faced with serious conditions in life. And I, I think uh, I was particularly touched by your positive attitude. Thank you. Uh, if I may, I just have two questions. Uh, why did you not apply for one of the permanent uh, posts created to be seconded to the Lim Claims Court in preparations for the Land uh, Court? I need to go back a little bit into my into my history as as far as that is concerned. Um, I obviously had quite a focused area of work when I was doing work on the land claims court, adjudicatory work on the land claims court. I was appointed very young to that court. I was appointed when I was 35 years old. Um, my term was a fixed term. I came to the end of the five years and I had to decide what, what now. Um, we were, all of the judges were offered the opportunity to apply to the High Court and then to do work in both the High Court and, and the Land Claims Court as, as, as seconded judges. Um, at that stage in my life, there were a number of things that concerned me about continuing with the focus on, on the land work. Um, the Commission, as I've touched on, took a decision that they were going to try and deal with land restitution cases predominantly through negotiation. The consequence of that was that uh, we didn't get anything like the number of restitution claims coming to the land claims court that I had anticipated. And that was the stuff that I was really in interested in, in doing. Um, I was also concerned about whether or not there was a clear enough vision on the part of the government for the work of the land claims court um, and, and, how it should, and how it should be structured. Um, because that was obviously important for, for a consideration of whether one continued to work that. Um, and I was also mindful of the fact that I would go into a position, if I were to go into a high court position, uh, having had a very focused area of work, and I wanted to broaden my experience. Um, I also, to be honest, I missed practice uh, at that relatively young age. Despite the fact that I'd enormously enjoyed my time on the land claims court, um, I felt a need to go back into practice and I thought I could be a better lawyer and ultimately a better judge if I broadened my practice beyond the land reform field. And that's effectively what I did as an advocate. I moved into other areas. I continued to do a substantial amount of land related work, but I've broadened my vision. In a way, if I were to go back to the land court, it would in a way be like going back to 1995 where, where I started. My horizons have shifted a little bit. My range of work has shifted a little bit. And, 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 and that's, that's essentially the reason why I haven't seen that as a direction for, my, for me to go in. Thank you very much. My last question, um, from what I have read about you, uh, you seem to be the kind of advocate one would want uh, next to him or her. To what an extent have you been able to transfer skills to previously disadvantaged and women in particular. Thank you. Uh, perhaps I can answer the question on a, on, a, on, a, on a broader basis of what my uh, what my commitment to transformation has been over the years. Um, at the time that I was an attorney in Cape Town, uh, we we firstly. Uh, in our firm tried to challenge the traditional direction of work being steered in the direction of white advocates. So I briefed, I briefed many black advocates uh, during my time as an attorney. Um, some of them ultimately have, 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 uh, have, have ended up in the judiciary. For example, uh, Chief Justice Langer was one of the, one of the advocates that we used to brief. Um, we used to brief advocate, I used to brief advocate Desai a lot. Um, and then people who are still at the bar, advocate, advocate Denzel Portkita, for example, um, advocate Omar, who became the Minister of Justice, and so on. 
Um, I also tried to involve uh, women and black lawyers in the work that we did in the public interest law department. If you have a look at my CV, there's a case of Corin George versus the Minister of Education. Uh, that was a case involving a woman being denied uh, a housing subsidy on the basis that she was married. Uh, I got a very young um, attorney in the firm called Estelle Morkel to come and argue part of the case with me. She was terribly nervous about it, but I said, come on, let's, let's, let's go and do it. And she argued part of that case with me and we were very successful and we got a housing subsidy for, for Mrs. George. Um, at the bar, I started off in a group called the Island Group. Um, that group uh, was not a transformed group. Uh, there was a large group of us within the group who were concerned about that fact. Uh, we agitated for transformation. We weren't happy at the, with the pace at which transformation took place. But already during that time in my own practice, I was, I was, I was working with people and ultimately when I became senior counsel, started having junior counsel working with me who were either women or, or, or black. Um, we reached a point in that particular group where uh, we were deeply unhappy with the pace of transformation and a group of us essentially put the rest of the group to terms to embrace transformation. They weren't willing to do it and we split. Uh, I chose, there were two groups that people ended up in. Most people went to Tulamela group in Johannesburg. I went to the Victoria and Tulamela group. Uh, I liked the group because it was ahead of the other groups in terms of transformation. It didn't have a, a rigid hierarchical structure. It had uh, junior council and women council as group leaders. It had a completely democratic system of appointing group leaders. You change every two years. You do it by democratic vote. And I was, I was, I was desperate, frankly, to get into a group where white advocates were in the minority, which was the case in the Victoria and Tanga group. Um, within that group, I have continued to, uh, in virtually every case, uh, either have women or uh, black counsel or both um, working with me as as junior counsel. That's my practice. We have a junior fund in the group, which provides funding to uh, involve young advocates, black advocates and women advocates in work when they're starting off. Um, and I've uh, used made use of that fund a lot. Um, and then uh, the same with the Bar Council, similar fund. But then I also have an open door policy in my chambers. The door is always open unless I'm in a consultation. I will stop anything and drop anything to assist to assist a younger person. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Mbabinishe. Um, Honorable Taba. Uh, thanks, uh, CJ. Um, the area that I was going to focus on has been covered by my uh, colleagues. Uh, let me uh, wave my right uh, for now. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, Commissioner Matolo Depo. Uh, thank you, CJ, and good afternoon, Mr. Johnson. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Okay, uh, I have to take you back to the issue of land. Uh, you, you have been referring to the matter of transport community. I, I just have to declare that I'm one of the beneficiaries of those. But the challenge that we have, the community is not settled. I beg your pardon? The community has not settled yet because of the... I think one of the issues is for us to try and understand what you meant when you said beneficial occupation. There's still a lot of infighting within the community. And I'm taking this uh, advantage of trying to understand what you meant. Maybe I'll advise the community better. And following from my, <clears throat> my fellow commissioners that you are writing scholarly judgments, I think this is the one that I need clarity on. What, is, what did you mean by saying beneficial occupation? The Law required that, it, as I said, a, a, a right in land be established by the by the community for me to be able to recognise the validity of the land claim. The difficulty was that although that community lived on the land, apartheid effectively determined that they couldn't be the owners of the land and weren't and weren't the owners of the land. In addition, if one looked carefully at the at the legal provision, 
they were hammered already from the 1800s by provisions, for example, in the 1890s that only require only allowed, for example, four family four African families to reside on a on a, on a farm. Um, and uh, when the Group Areas Act came came in, again it, it presented obstacles to their ever claiming a, a, a strong right a strong right to the land, but the definition of right in land in the Restitution Act in Section 1 recognizes beneficial occupation for a period of at least 10 years as a basis for a right in land. So it was that that I settled on as the basis for uh, giving justice to, to the community. And I defined beneficial occupation on the basis that, on a broad basis, which sought to be inclusive um, and which said that, that if people uh, were, if I remember correctly, uh, using the land, were in occupation, had the intention to hold the land, uh, had actual detentio or, or, or occupation of the land, and wished to use it for any beneficial purpose, that was enough for them to qualify to be able to get restitution. Um, I'm not sure if that assists, but that, 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 that the, the focus of that judgment was on um, was on trying to find a basis for recognizing that there was a right in land. I might be understanding you incorrectly, but what I understand you're perhaps talking about is how one then defines the community when it comes to who are the beneficiaries of the who are the beneficiaries of the restitution award, who makes up that community, um, and that also was one of the issues which I canvassed in the judgment: is what is the definition of a community? Uh, the difficulty that you face is that the definition in Section 1 of the Act says a group of persons whose rights in land are determined by shared rules determining, determining access to land held in common. The difficulty is once you're forcefully removed, you can end up with no land and nowhere. You, can, you, can, you, you, can, you, you can't point to any land that, that, that you're holding. And so one needs then to look at other manifestations of community to see who the people are. And essentially what it is, is the people who've stayed in touch with each other, the people who've continued to identify. At Kranzpurt, there would be an annual, as I recall, gathering where people would go back to Kranzpurt and tend to the graves and have a meeting. And it would essentially be those people who continue to cohere as a community who would be the beneficiaries. Just a follow up, I think, I think you may have good intentions when we define it. Sorry, I beg your pardon? I think you may have had good intentions, but it is actually not solving the problems of the transport community. They are still fighting about who really are the beneficiaries of the land. I'm sad to hear that. Um, <clears throat> well, Advocate Dotson, I led you uh, earlier. Now it's time for questions. Let, let's engage with section 174.5. Which re of the Constitution, which reads, at all times, at least four members of the Constitutional Court must be persons who were judges at the time they were appointed to the Constitutional Court. We are at the time when the Constitutional Court does not only consider constitutional matters, but also um, points of law of general public importance. And that has turned out to be virtually anything, any legal point that is considered to be sufficiently important to the public to be entertained by the Constitutional Court. Now, why, would, why do you think the Constitution says at least four members and two, do you think this provision ought to apply in practice now at this stage where we are regard being had to the amendment of the constitution to extend the criteria of issues that can be considered by the constitutional court legal points or points of law of general public importance uh I would respectfully submit that it perhaps enhances the need for uh, judges who come the route of Section 174.5 um, because the consequence of the expanded jurisdiction is that there's an expanded range of issues that can come before the court. And perhaps there's a greater call for a greater range of expertise 
uh, for the constitutional court. And I would respectfully submit that, that perhaps I might be able to be of assistance for the court from that perspective. I should, right. I should perhaps emphasize right. that, I beg your pardon. No, 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 f f f emphasize and then I'll come with uh, my next question. Uh, it is, it is, of course, at least four. So I'm not trying to suggest that seven should be, seven should, should all be people who, who haven't been the root uh, of being a judge at the time that they're appointed. Um, obviously, it's a flexible criterion. And, uh, and I think it would be fair to expect that the majority of people would be judges at the time that they were appointed. Um, <clears throat> now, just a point of information before I proceed to my question. Justice Mazanga, after, um, resigning was a high court judge acting judge president acting judge pres acting uh, justice of the supreme court of appeal and had also acted as a justice of the constitutional court just for what it is worth would someone who is not a judge be appointable to a su to the supreme court of appeal whose judgment are appealable to the constitutional court. Am I making sense? Yeah, I'm, I'm Would an advocate successfully be uh, successfully be considered for a vacancy of a bearing in mind also that are appealable to the constitutional court? I'm trying to highlight the possible oddity between an advocate being able to go straight to the constitutional court but possibly not being able to go straight to the Supreme Court of Appeal. I, I didn't see anything in the Constitution that prov would prevent an advocate from being able to go straight to the Supreme Court of Appeal. Why do you think it's not happening? Why are they not applying? I why do they, I, 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 why I think do they apply only to the Constitutional Court but not to the Supreme Court of Appeal? Um, I think it's probably the way that practice, the practice of appointments in the Supreme Court of Appeal has worked. There simply is no history of it. And I think that's factually what accounts for it. There is factually a history of people to, uh, to, to, to be appointed in the constitutional court who haven't gone that path. So I think it's a factual practice. I don't think it's a, a, a legal requirement or a question of, of, of what the law dictates. The way things have developed, do you think it's still practicable for an advocate to go straight to the Constitutional Court without first having gone through the other courts, the High Court in particular? Is it still practicable? Yes, I believe it. I believe that it is. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Advocate Dodson. You've been you've been very helpful. You you are excused. Thank you, Chief Justice, and thank you, Commissioners, for hearing me out. Thank you.